This is a map representing Singapore's national cycling plan. Currently, it consists of 525 kilometers of cycling paths, and the plan expects the network to be 1,300 kilometers by the end of 2030, more than doubling its current size. This network is key in creating Singapore's ideal city that encourages mobility, accessibility, a decrease in CO2 emissions, a boost in tourism, and increase in public health. The Singaporean government aims to do this in three areas. First, by creating a prominent cycling and walking infrastructure, better than any other city in the world. A walkable urban environment brings many positive impacts to a city's economy, such as reducing traffic congestion, improving public health, and boosting tourism. In 2012, the city-state completed the Labrador Coastal Walk that allows natives and tourists to enjoy its mangrove and coastal views. This is one of many but important projects that aim to encourage an active lifestyle and bring people closer to nature and scenery, something that is needed in the world's second most densely populated country. Singapore's rejuvenation of their Esplanade Park and Empress Place creates calming traffic and returns road equity back to pedestrians. It did this by reducing one of the roads from four lanes to two and turned 50% of another road and bridge into a walkway. The government created campaigns to encourage people to walk places, and they quickly realized they must enhance the attractiveness and things to do in these walkable areas. In the rejuvenation, they also transplanted eight 90-ton heritage trees to shade the pathways from Singapore's heat, leading to the creation of more open areas to allow pop-up events that draw people to activities, not only destinations. Singapore further aims to connect all of the country not just the inner city. They're in the midst of creating the North to South Corridor, an active mobility and public transport corridor dedicated to bus, foot, and cycling paths. The corridor was stretched 21.5 kilometers long, linking the northern towns to the city center, and is expected to be completed in 2026. Walkability isn't the only aspect that Singapore is aiming for. Cycling is a very important form of transportation that many other cities have aimed to optimize. Take Amsterdam, for example a city notorious for its citizens using cycling as the preferred mode of transportation. Compared to Singapore's 525 kilometers of cycling paths, Los Angeles has around 560 kilometers of bike paths and lanes within this network despite having a lower population. Even with a larger cycling network, Los Angeles is still known for its heavy traffic and CO2 emissions. So, what is this difference that makes cycling more effective in Singapore? The difference is that bike lanes in Los Angeles lead nowhere making them not practical for public transport and more for cycling enthusiasts, while Singapore uses them to connect cyclists from their homes to major transport hubs and key amenities, such as food centers, schools, and supermarkets. Another difference is the safety of these bike paths. Los Angeles is named one of the most difficult and dangerous cities in the U.S. to ride a bike in, where hazards are posed to cyclists by distracted drivers and the terrible shape of most streets. In 2019 alone, 39 cyclists were killed in Los Angeles County, Singapore, on the other hand, builds paths that are dedicated to cycling. To further promote environmental-friendly modes of transportation, in 2017, the Land Transport Authority announced a 15-year plan for Singapore to reduce its reliance on cars. This allows Singapore to create a more sustainable and livable city by decreasing noise pollution and CO2 emissions. Although this effort isn't as effective as the rest, in recent years, Singapore's vehicle population has increased. To combat this, the government put in place laws and regulations to increase the price of cars, hoping that this will motivate people to start cycling, walking, and using public transport and car sharing. However, the concept that high prices would constrain buyers did not seem to work out. Many Singaporeans still view owning a car as a status symbol, and so price only drives up demand. Instead, those who are aiming to decrease the vehicle population say that there is a need to promote the car light vision as a lifestyle. And this is somewhat working. The newer generation are starting to view private cars as less environmentally sustainable and as depreciating liabilities. Environmental sustainability in an urban setting is another focus of Singapore's government. In 2017, 80.5 hectares of sky-rise greenery was installed on 110 buildings, with hopes to increase to 200 hectares by 2030. And as of 2020, 46.5% of Singapore's land was covered in green space with tree canopy covering almost 30%. This led to Singapore becoming known as a biophilic city, a city with a love of nature and the natural world. With help from an organization named Biophilic Cities, Singapore started to blend nature into urban planning. 
Singapore has also established horticulture research parks, where methods of growing plants vertically are being researched, developed, and implemented. They are helping introduce nature back into urban areas where biodiversity would otherwise be suppressed. Urban greenery allows a lot of benefits for the city. Added greenery helps mitigate the urban heat effect, while also improving air quality, where the plants act as air purifiers. It also captures rainwater, reduces interior cooling requirements, and reduces CO2 and air pollutants. This graph shows the per capita CO2 emissions of Singapore, and as more green space is added into the city, we can see a downward trend of these emissions, even with the population of Singapore increasing. Not only does the greenery itself provide benefits, but the architecture to support greenery allows a lot of natural light, increasing productivity and comfort for those in the building. The Singaporean government has been working hard trying to popularize urban greenery. It created financial incentives for building developers to install their own sky-rise greenery. With these incentives, green buildings can be cost-efficient, with the carbon-neutral programs and tax breaks ultimately paying for itself. In some areas, high-rise developers are required to fully replace any greenery that they remove during construction, and housing developments are also required to have resident access to green space. Singapore is hard at work in creating the world's ideal city, and it does look promising, although they have a lot more to go. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe, and I will see you next time.